And this evening's discussion is Shinbutsu Shugo. And um, I thought that this would be an interesting picture. And Ichishima Sensei recognizes the people who were sitting there. And they're in the process of making Shimanawa, which is the Shinto uh, rope with paper elements that come, come down from it used for purification. And this is in front of the kuri at Tamunin, so that the, the Danka members were making the Shimanawa for, I think that was probably for New Year's, um, which is, of course, a Shinto element. I thought it would be perfect to discuss mm -hmm. Shinbutsu Shugo. Next, please. And just a, a few terms to start us off. We're, I'm talking about Shimbutsu Shugo this evening, but many people actually conflate a second idea that's related to that. And that idea is Honji Suijaki, Jaku. And Honji Suijaku is the relationship between Shinto Kami and um, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas within Buddhism. So it's the, the idea that for each of the Shinto deities, there is one or more, and they, they mix and match in various ways. There's one and more, one or more Buddhas and Bodhisattvas that are considered the equivalents. But we'll talk about that when we get down to it. And the figure on the, on the right, I always think of as an interesting um, idea because that's the Hachiman. And of course, in especially Northern Kyushu, there was a Hachiman cult. Uh, that was a Shinto uh, cult, and Hachiman was one of the Shinto deities. But in this particular um, depiction, he's, he's, he's dressed and is presenting as a Buddhist monk. And so it demonstrates the degree to which uh, Shinto and, and Buddhism were syncretic. And please go on to the next one. I'll begin going over the, the handout in just a moment. But I thought this would also demonstrate the degree to which there is uh, synchrony. What you see in the front there are two uh, Tendai monks who are leading a pilgrimage of people through one of the uh, Shinto shrines. Uh, and I can tell that they're, they're Tendai monks as a result of the um, particular types of things that they're wearing. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to be talking about the synchrony of Buddhism and Shinto, and I think that many people, um, we, we've talked about this both directly and indirectly over the years, but I've never really done a, um, a presentation on it, and I personally find it really fascinating, but it's difficult to stay focused, so I have to do it in broad strokes, otherwise I end up going on a tangent about something that most people are going to fall asleep regarding, especially if it's midnight where you are. Um, and, we, and, and I don't want to get caught up in the scholarly debates because this is a subject about which both Japanese and non-Japanese scholars love to have discussions it, because there's so much interpretive material to go over. <clears throat> Let's start with the basic information. And that is now. Please refer to your handout, which should have been with your uh, with the invite. And some of the basic information, just to ground everybody, what is Shinto? And I'm just going to read some of this, and then I'll I'll talk about it a little bit later. Shinto is an indigenous religious tradition of Japan, and its origins trace back to animistic beliefs dating from the earliest Jomon peoples. They are reported to be from about 14th century BCE to about 300 uh, BCE. So the, the Jomon people are considered some of the earliest people for which we have, we have archeological evidence. Um, people that followed the, the Jomon were the Yoyoi people and the Yoyoi people are what we think of the area that they occupied is the area that we think of as the core of Japan up until uh, many centuries later. 
And so uh, the, the Jomon people um, were considered to have initiated what we think of as Shinto today. Uh, its main features, as I say on here, are an animistic belief in the sanctity of nature, shamanistic practices, ancestor cults, respect for authority and communal values, and strong capacity to integrate and homogenize foreign elements. That last part is especially important in relation to this discussion. And as Kuroda Toshio has made clear, Shinto did not mean the same things throughout history. In particular, it did not designate an established system of religious institutions and their beliefs and rituals until after the 18th century. That was really rather late. So what we think of as Shinto and, and what we see as Shinto today, if you were to go to Japan and you visit the various uh, Jinja, the various Shinto shrines, all of that material, while the origins of it go back prehistorically, what we see today is not the same as it would have been even 200 years ago, quite honestly. Uh, what is referred to as Shinto, the way of the kami, didn't become common, didn't be, the term Shinto didn't even become a common term until the seventh century, when Prince Shotoku affirmed Shinto, Buddhism, and Confucianism simultaneously holding them in balance in the 17 article constitution. The term Shinto was derived from the Chinese reference to local Japanese shamanistic practices. So in many ways, the term Shinto, as we think of it, really was applied to Japanese shaman. It was not a term that was uh, derived from, from Japanese. And the term, the classical kami are those that appear in the oldest text, including the Kojiki and the Hyun Shoki, 712 and 720, respectively. Um, and those are the first written cultural histories of Japan. So it wasn't until the, the beginning of the 8th century that we had a record of what we think of as Shinto today. That was the first, that was, those were the first writings, the first histories uh, of Japan. And Buddhism in Japan, which we talk about quite often, just to emphasize this aspect, was a gradual process of integration into Japanese culture. Uh, formally introduced in Japan in the sixth century, it was highly adaptive. And we often look at the beginning of the Han era as the beginning of quote unquote Japanese Buddhism. The Buddhism that we see before then was before um, Edo before 800, we'll say, uh, was really a combination of Chinese and Chike and a little bit of Shila um, Buddhism that had been brought to Japan. And then during the Nara period, you did have Indians and other people from Asian countries who were coming over as monks and nuns who were uh, instructing the Japanese people in Buddhism. and. and um, uh, formulating the philosophies and the practices, all those things. But it really didn't become Japanese until the beginning of the Han era uh, in 794. <clears throat> and the introduction of Buddhism, I, you know, I, I realize that often we talk about the introduction of Buddhism, and we talk about it occurring first, Buddhism occurred sort of informally people who had been coming to Japan because they were merchants, they were, you know, a wave of the seafarers who had blown, blown off course and entered into Japan. They were people who had informally introduced Buddhism in much the way that Buddhism had been introduced along the Silk Road in the many century, a century before that. And we, we often present it as, but it was formally accepted in the middle of the, Seventh century, around six six four hundreds was when it, we begin to see Buddhism elements of Buddhism in Japan, but it didn't really get a strong push until around uh, six thirty eight six fifty is the date that's often given as formally uh, Buddhism was introduced, <clears throat> and 
when we talk about it, we never talk about the opposition to Buddhism. But there was a very strong opposition to Buddhism during that period of time between the 400s until uh, around 650. And the opposition came on in several different directions. One opposition was, like any people, the Japanese people had Shinto, or at least what we now refer to as Shinto. They had their indigenous practices. And in addition to the opposition to a foreign element trying to bring something to Japan, there was also uh, a, an interesting dynamic. Korea, what we call Korea today was really three separate kingdoms, Pachike, Shila, and Gordrio. And they, specifically Shila and Pachike, were trying to introduce Buddhism into Japan. And there was, a, there was a, a difference in the, their approaches and what they were trying to introduce. And you had anti shila and anti pachike sentiments depending upon who in Japan was listening, right? So you had several different elements going on, one of which is here's this foreign religion, which of course to the Japanese, they understood that it was from India, but what does India mean? But certainly it's coming from China and it's coming from Pachike uh, and Shila. And so there was a, this opposition to Buddhism that wasn't really resolved. That is the opposition until the imperial court saw a reason to embrace Buddhism around 650. And that's why we have that date, was around then. Um, and there were clans who felt that the Kami would be offended by the introduction of Buddhist ideas and deities. Stop and think about that. It's not just who needs these foreign ideas, but the kami. The kami are the spirits that occupy the trees, the rocks, the mountains, the streams, the clouds, all the natural elements that you see around you. And further, there was the issue of imperial ascension to the throne of the empress and emperor. And by the way, Notice that I say empress, because Japan had empresses until essentially the 8th century. Uh, that's when it went to an imperial system with emperors only. Up until the 8th century, you could have empresses uh, as well as emperors. Um, and the various clans, the Uji uh, in Japan, the, the, the term for clans is Uji, the various Uji had their own practices, their own and I'll refer to it as Shinto, Shinto practices. So this clan had a different set of practices than the other clan. And you had a number of different clans. And so there was no consistency of what Shinto was even. You know, when we stop and think about something like Christianity, we think of the commonality of Christianity. We have different denominations today, but we think of certain commonalities. Well, there was no commonality what we think of as Shinto during that period of time. Um, and so all the rituals, the offerings, the purifications, I mean, there are four elements of what we think that are associated with Shinto in general. Uh, purification, uh, offerings, prayers, and feasts. Those are the four things that we associate with, with Shinto rituals. And so uh, what they look like would be very different. I mean, far more different than a Southern Baptist church service contrasted to a Eastern Orthodox <laughs> church service by, by contrast. Um, so th that the opposition to Buddhism was largely coming from the indigenous religious traditions that were there. Uh, and so it was that, that's one of the things that impeded the adoption of Buddhism into Japan. Now, the term, and back to your, to your handout, the term Shinbutsu Shugo is used when referring to the early reconciliations of Shinto and Buddhism. A Hanju, Hanji Suijaku is used to refer to a theory that kami, gods, spirits, deified mortals, ancestors, natural phenomena, and supernatural powers were treated as incarnations of the Buddhist deities. <laughs> Um, 
And scholars write one of the first efforts to reconcile Shinto and Buddhism was in the eighth century during the Nara period, the late Nara period, uh, founding the so called Jinjuji. These are shrine temple complexes. And so from that time, and actually from the Heian era period, from the, but, but from this early period of time in Nara, the reconciliation of Buddhism and Shinto meant that you would have a Buddhist temple and a Shinto shrine in the same place. There was, there was always an association. Now, you see in Japan today, you see, well, even at the time, you would see many roadside shrines. These would be small shrines, you know, the, the anywhere from the size of something that would be, um, uh, you know, just a couple of feet high, maybe a, a meter tall and a half a meter wide to something that could occupy something that's a couple of meters tall and a meter wide, small roadside shrines, um, Shinto shrines, that would be uh, shrines to the local deity, whatever deity that might be. Um, however, you had the beginnings of more formal shrines during this period of time. And these more formal shrines occurred then, and we're now referring to the uh, Jinguji. These more formal shr shrines often were within a temple con compound, but they were shrines to a specific local deity. And that, that, that's the beginning of this, syn this syncretic, uh, the nature, the syncretic nature of the two, of the two religions. Um, when Todaiji was built, and Todaiji is a very famous um, temp Buddhist temple in <coughs> Nara that is famous for its Daibuzatsu, which is uh, uh, the Daibuzatsu, um, the largest Buddha that's enclosed in Japan. I, how tall is it to It's about 10 meters tall, at, le at least 10 meters tall. And uh, it's Dainichi Nyorai is the, is the image that's there. And um, uh, it's considered today one of, I, I think it is the largest wooden building in existence in the world, Daiji Temple. And it's one third the size that it used to be. <laughs> so this is an enormous temple. But in that compound, you're going to find a, a Shinto shrine. And during the Heian period, there was an association between Shinto shrines and specifically Shingon Buddhism and Tendai Buddhism. And as a matter of fact, one of the types of Tori that you see, not, not the type that you see in this picture, is called Yobu Tori, and that's associated specifically with Shinto shrines. Uh, I mean, excuse me, with um, um, Shingon temples, the shrines within Shingon temples. Um, and you'll find that up until the middle of the 19th <coughs> century, virtually every Shingon temple, every Tendai temple had a Shinto shrine associated with it. And part of this was because of the mystical aspect of Shinto played in directly to the esoteric Mikyo forms of Buddhism that you see in Tendai and Shinto. Okay. Um, so the relationship of the Kami and the Buddhist is a major characteristic of the apparent content of uh, Buddhist Shinto syncretism, and the term Hanju, Hanji su, Suijaku can be used to refer to the fully developed syncretism. That's, that's a quote. Um, the impression that's given by, by scholars about either Shinto or Buddhism is that they were separate religions with borders that overlapped, thanks to the theory of Hanji Suijaku. On the other hand, if you read novels, I'm thinking of um, uh, Tales of Heiki, et cetera, and observations of religious practices and religious places today suggest that instead that 
mingled Shinto and Buddhism has been and is still an important system of belief and practice. Institutional mingling was pervasive enough to see widespread destruction when the religions were declared separate at the time in the Meiji Restoration. And so this syncretic nature had been not only promulgated early, but had been maintained and been promoted. There were times there was opposition to it by various factors, but for the most part had been promoted until the mid 19th century. So from around 800 until the mid 19th century, beginning in the Meiji Restoration, specifically in 1868, the Articles of Confederation at that time, the new constitution specifically separated Buddhism and Shinto. And the reason for that was that the forces, the, the pro-Meiji forces, which was really concerned with modernizing Japan, making Japan a modern state um, in the mid 19th century. Japan for the previous several hundred years on the Tokugawa regime had been very isolated. Uh, and while there were European elements in Japan who were bringing things like firearms and, and other materials, it was still fairly isolated. Middle of the 19th century, the modernists, we'll call them for lack of a better term, though most Japanologists would never use that term, but the modernists were promoting the emperor as the new leader of the nation rather than the shogunate, which were the military uh, rulers of Japan up until that time. And the Tokugawa were the last, last line of, of shogunates. Uh, and so they were promoting Shinto as a way to further increase the importance of the emperor. And in so doing, they wanted to break apart Buddhism and Shinto. Well, here's the thing. You can do that institutionally. It's like we can, we can say that in the United States, we had equal rights in 1965. Do we have equal rights today? There's a law that said we have voting rights. Everybody has a right to vote equally. 1965. But today we don't really have that. That's an example of what I'm talking about. You can make that declaration. That doesn't mean it's so. <laughs> and so institutionally, there was an attempt. As a matter of fact, Buddhist temples were sacked, Buddhist temples were destroyed, monks were driven out, Buddhist monks were driven out of the temples, temple complex. Many of them were killed, and as as a result of of the Meiji Restoration. Um, however, me, what year were they? Th this would have been started in 1868. It really re reached its height around 1872. So, but by the time you get to the late 19th century, the various Buddhist schools had begun to. Um, respond to the opposition and they have begun to reformulate. And so you had the reformulation so that the time you get to the end of, uh, even before the end of the Meiji era, which would have been, uh, the Tamami remind me, 1912? The men, end of the Meiji era was 1912, is that correct? I forget exactly the date. In that 19 teens. Um, you had um, Buddhism that had recovered to a great extent. But the point is that you had the separation. So today, if you go to a Tendai or Shingon temple, there's still a shrine that's there, but it's no longer being administered by the Buddhist temple. It's now a separate organization. Starting in the mid 19th century, started the process of state Shinto, you did not have state Shinto until the 19th century, mid 19th century. And th th that is a, the, form that it, the form that it takes. <clears throat> um, 
So the idea that Shinto could be studied separately from Buddhism with separate attention given to Honji Suijaku is not due to a study of history. And what I have to say is, I think is really important, but to an overemphasis on doctrine to define religion and to the motives for strict separation of Shinto and Buddhism, both in fact and in scholarship from the early Meiji until the end of the Second World War. And what I'm saying there is that we in the West, and then by virtue of Japanese scholars who are adopting Western methods, were beginning to look at religion as doctrinal systems. It was the beginning of the Meiji Restoration also, then I talked about this, the Shimbutsu Bunri, Kami and Buddhism separation order took place. Uh, and, and like I said, that law formally took place in 1868. Recently, it's become popular to deny the independent existence of Shinto before the 15th or 16th century and to, and to stress its intertwined character with Buddhism. And this is a correction that is to the common view that Shinto is a pure primitive religion native to Japan and has endured to the present day. In other words, we've seen in the last, and, and it's, it's occurred within the time that I've been studying Asian, specifically uh, Japan culture within the last 30 years. You've seen a shift from this notion of Shinto as being the pure religion that persisted, to one that has looked at it as as a religion which has been intertwined with Buddhism in very specific ways. And recently, uh, and, and I should say that it's not just due to the attitude of scholars. In Buddhism, as in other religions, doctrine and scholarship are presented as the content of religion, even though most of a monk or a lay person's religious activities are spent in observances related only distantly and not at all to doctrine. I mean, realistically, whether it's Shinto, it's Buddhism, it's Roman Catholicism, how much of people's practices are really devoted to doctrine? They're really based upon other elements. In the study of Japanese religion, scholars, well, I'm, I'm, I actually won't get into that. Um, so back to, the, back to the handout sheet, I gotta pay attention to the time here. One might soul say that the goal of Shinto, Shinto might be defined as purity and the goal of Buddhism as awakening. Pure in a Shinto sense is the pure land of Buddhism as well. And since early times, Buddhist paradises have been established on mountains. The preaching of Lotus Sutra was not moved to a nameless location. It was Vulture Peak and Ragajar. Manjushri's paradise is the Chinese mountain Utaishan. So there's always been this notion within Buddhism of sacrality of place and location. Okay, I could go on for a while about this. I'm running out of time and Koshin's giving me the, the hook pretty soon over here. Um, so we'll stop on the philosophy and the history and I'm gonna answer two questions that naturally arise. Now, I have to say that the first question actually came from Maynard and when I, when I reminded him we we're going to be doing this tonight because we'd had a conversation about this a while ago. He said, here's what I want to know. And I said, okay, I'm still writing it up. Here's what you can know. To the extent that, mo and this is the question, to the extent that modern Japanese are willing to answer, what would they say if they were asked about their own religious beliefs and practices? Are they personal or just cultural phenomena for them? Do they go beyond weddings and funerals? Okay. And I, I write in, in there, the direct answer to the first part of the question is, it's personal. Though I would suggest that it's because most people, including Japanese, don't perceive that what they're doing is in a cultural context. We do things that we do without thinking of it as part of our cultural worldview. We do it because it's what we do. It's the right thing. We don't really question it. Or we might question, don't get me wrong, we might question, but we don't necessarily think of it just in the cultural context. The average Japanese would say they don't have a religion. 
period. And then they will describe the various Buddhist and Shinto activities that they partake in. <laughs> That's the reality. The second part would be that there's very little weekly or other regular religious attendances beyond weddings, funerals, special days, New Year's, Oban, et cetera, in Asian religion, as there is the Abrahamic religions, religions that designate a Sabbath. The exception would be Shinja, especially devoted Buddhist practitioners would tend more frequently. Shinja are people who participate in pilgrimage to be counted upon to clean the temple, which is seen as a devotional activity, attend sutra classes, meditation, etc. But just like if we're talking about the Roman Catholic Church, how many people actually go to church on Sunday these days? There's a small number who are going to go to church every day. They're going to go to mass every day. There's another number that are going to go to church most Sundays. There's another group that are going to go to church on Easter and Christmas and days like that. Well, it's no different in Japan. <laughs> it's the same process. So I think the difference is that in the Abrahamic traditions, we have the notion of a Sabbath. It's on uh, Saturday if you're a Jew. It's on Sunday if you're you're Christians on Friday if you're Muslim, and people are expected to attend on those days. The more fervent one's faith and belief system, the more likely you are to attend. However, because you don't attend doesn't mean that you're not Catholic. It just means that you're lazy <laughs> or something else. <laughs> okay, so the second question is, if Buddhism is a universal religion and Shinto a location-specific religion, what does the separation of these two religions have to do with me, a Buddhist outside Japan in the 21st century? Is that a question that you would ask, Chip? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm doing things like this, I say, what, what, what is Chip going to ask? <clears throat> Nelson, in his book, Enduring, well, all Asian Buddhism includes other religions, Taoism, Confucianism, Dejong, Bon, Shinto, etc. And they are part of the Buddhism that is brought outside of Asia. These religions place the person within a larger context of the natural environment and speak to the interrelatedness of humans and the cosmos in a concrete manner. European rationalism and individualization is have separated humans from locality in the natural world in a way that's led to the environmental crisis and a feeling of isolation. And so I think that we can learn a great deal by the emulating these traditions in recapturing our true nature. That's what I wrote. However, to go on, Nelson in his book, Enduring Identities, The Guise of Shinto in Contemporary Japan, writes that Kudasunishin a noted Shinto scholar says, to think of Shinto as worshiping nature or as reverencing natural objects because of some innate quality of sacredness is a profound mistake. Instead, it was the propensity of Kami to take up temporary residence within natural objects that must be recognized as fundamental in the development of attitudes toward the natural world. Thus, the second character of the word for shrine Jinja, that is Ja, the second character, does not refer to an organization as in Keisha, but to a forest, the Japanese term Mori. And so to answer the question, I think that by looking at Shinto in relation to Buddhism, in relation to Tendai, is to begin to go into the depths of how Buddhism adopted many of the Shinto notions about the world, the natural world, and the kami that inhabit the spaces. Next. So now, now that I, I and, and by the, um, we have here some of the references that I used. I have another stack of books here that I drew from. Um, in addition to what you see there, and I couldn't get them all on the screen, so I just left it at that. Um, 
next slide, please. And if any if anybody's interested in that, I can I can always uh, send you a copy of that bibliography. And by the way, what you see there is a fox and in Shinto Inadi shrines, which is the are the fox shrines are some of the most proliferate shrines in Japan. So the fox shrine, fox. Interestingly enough, in Shinto is not unlike fox among the Anasazi and the, the Southwest Native Americans as a trickster. Mm. So why don't we open it up for questions and I can take just a few, but we don't have a lot of time. So, uh, and, and let me just ask uh, Ichishima Sensei, if you had anything that you wanted to add to what I was saying. Uh, sensei, you're, you're muted. Hi. Uh, uh, thank you for introduction of uh, Japanese Shintoism and uh, Buddhist Buddhism integrations. And uh, I think uh, there are two uh, streams of Shinto and Bud Buddhist integration. One is uh, uh, Shingon style, that is, you know, mandala. <laughs> Uh, Kongokai and Taizokai, two mandalas uh, that is symbolizing uh, Tori uh, gate. Uh, and in the Tendai way, San no Ichijitsu Shinto, San no is, San is mountain, O is king. The Chinese character mountains or king, uh, they, you know, three lines, for instance, uh, Yama as mountain, uh, three uh, in one, you know, horizontal way connecting uh, those three. That is Buppo uh, So, uh, or sometimes Ku uh, Getu, you know, the emptiness, provisionals, and the middle. These are symbolized uh, in the Tori uh, gate. And uh, why does uh, uh, Shingon emphasizes uh, mandalas, that is Pajra uh, that mandala and uh, uh, embryo mandala, uh, Taizokai. So uh, two, what should I say, windows there on the pillar of the gate, that is uh, so Ryobu Shinto, we call it the Ryobu Shinto, the two uh, classes uh, Shinto, uh, that is Shingon style, I think. The, while the uh, Sanno style is Sanno Ichijitsu Shinto, especially you can see at the foot of Mount Hiei, that is uh, Hiei Jinja, or in Tokyo, Sanno Jinja, there. So these are, are representing two integrations, you know, streams, Shingon and the Tendai ways. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any, any quick questions? Denise and Tino. Tino? Um, I'm not sure if it's a quick question, but I wanted to ask, how would you reconcile the idea of Mitama no Kami and Ichirei Shikon, sh sh yeah, in Buddhism, since there's no idea of a permanent soul, right? But those would kind of challenge that, right? There's a challenge, and I, I think that one of the things that we have to recognize is that Shinto and Buddhism are still separate in their philosophy. They joined in many ways, but they're still separate in many ways. And so there is a dynamic tension that exists between them. And there's, there was no attempt to necessarily reconcile all the differences in philosophy. There was just an attempt to reconcile the way that people would practice so that a Japanese person could be both Shinto and Buddhist at the same time. Most people are really not as concerned about that kind of detail. At the same time, you'll notice that within a um, Buddhist, Japanese Buddhist service, 
It's Yoshima Sensei. I would say that maybe 15% of the service is actually Shinto. Would you say that would be correct? El well, Shinto. Uh, the Japanese people, uh, for instance, in the New Year's season, or just uh, the eve, uh, New Year's Eve, many people go to Shinto's uh, as well as uh, uh, Buddhist temples to pray for the, uh, you know, uh, peace. Right. And, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you, you, you see it in the funeral service specifically, you know, related uh, to your... Yeah, funeral service, you know, concerned mostly uh, people go to uh, the temples uh, to console their spirit, and the uh, mm, ha happy occasions like uh, uh, marriage uh, that they mostly go to Shinto style, I think. Yeah. Thinking about I'm sorry. Thinking about yeah, I was I was thinking, for instance, the use of salt. You know, in in a, from a Shinto perspective, you would. When you come home from the crematorium, the people would sprinkle salt on uh, the mourners, but the Buddhist priest would not allow the salt to be sprinkled on himself. So we can see we can see distinctions in that in that fashion. Right. Yeah. Denise. Okay. Denise. Denise. Oh, Denise. Yes. Hello. This is kind of a quick question coming from somebody who's so new to this. In Japan, how do the children learn Buddhism or, or, or Shinto or the combination of two? I mean, at 57, I'm starting this process. In here, when, as a Catholic, you went to Sunday school and then you eventually went to church with your parents. And it started that way. How does Buddhism get incorporated into the children as they're growing? I think they pick it up by a by just following what the parents do. Most kids are not going to go to the equivalent of a Sunday school uh, in Japan for, for Buddhism or Shinto, but they're going to receive instruction, at, you know, just through life. And and to be quite candid. And maybe maybe Joe would like to to respond to this, but to be quite candid, I think that when they're they know the basic things to do in a shrine or in a temple, Jinja or Otera. On the other hand, you'll see people very quizzical about well, what should I do? Because there isn't very much formal instruction um, to children uh, in that respect. Uh, did, would you like to address that, Joe? Yeah, I would mention three things. Uh, one is, uh, as of course, uh, through uh, the family practice. The second is uh, through friends. You know, sometimes uh, your friend may ask you uh, whether you'd like to go together to a shrine uh, to uh, visit for the new year, but also a school trip. Uh, um, uh, you usually... Um, spend three days or so in Kyoto, and you visit many places, including uh, Mount Hiei, <laughs> and also Shinto shrines and so forth. And so that's, these are the ways that uh, you are, you get exposed. Just one thing, uh, I think it is important here in this context to mention the importance of Prince Shotoku, uh, who lived in the sixth century. Because I think he's the one who really set the tone or decided approach, you know, um, how to um, approach different religious traditions. Right? And uh, in his 17 uh, constitutions, he really showed how different religious traditions can coexist together. And so in a way he showed how to make, how do I say this? E pluri, e pluri, e pluri, uh, unum. <laughs> How yes. to make yeah? How to make one out of many? Uh, and the uh, and the uh, uh, Dengyo Daishi really respected uh, Prince Shotoku, and he continued that legacy. So I think it's important to mention the the the, the contribution of Prince Shotoku. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, I have a 
Quick question for Jinto Sensei, because he has close contact with the, uh, college students. My question is, do Japanese college students in general consider or treat any one of the two, either Shinto Shrine or Buddhist Temple, as culturally sacred to them? I think, as the Monsin Sensei said, it, it varies uh, from person to person. But, but overall, I think they have this sense of reverence for those places. <laughs> but, but as the Monsin Sensei said earlier, I, I think they don't see themselves as religious in the, in the sense of affiliation. Mm -hmm. But the religious sensitivity, I see that they do have. Thank you. Thank you. I have time for one more question. No? I guess I must have, oh, uh, uh, Mushin, go ahead. Mushin, you're, you're muted. Who decided which kami are Buddhas and Bodhisattvas? That was that was decided by groups of, of both Shinto and Buddhist uh, back in the, the eighth century. I see. Yeah. They had a conference. Oh, they didn't really have a conference. It was it was much more in, informal <laughs> than that. Formalized as time went on. Yeah. We got coffee and donuts. And <laughs> yeah, they had coffee. Yeah, as the Scotia said, they got coffee and donuts and they sat around. Yeah. <laughs> And they did it virtually, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, every. And, and by the way, Maynard, did that did that answer your question? Yeah, one of the things. You muted, Maynard. Uh, you're muted, Maynard. There we go. Yes, it did answer my question. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to take the folks that are in the house into the hondo right now. And Koshin is going to stick with you and stay in here and continue the service. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your attention and I look forward to seeing you next week. This evening's discussion uh, concerning the bridge between Shinto and, uh, Shinto and Japanese Buddhism shows to what extent the two have a synchronous relationship. Not that Buddhism emphasizes the worship of natural phenomena per se, or that Shinto encourages the dissolving of self, for example, but more that both encourage one to cultivate uh, harmony between self and nature, self and other. In Shinto, one can displease kami and therefore receive their malevolence, mess with nature and nature strikes back. In Buddhism, one can create negative karma and therefore increase dukkha mess with nature and through interconnectedness, we all get messed with. The concept of uh, these two concepts aren't too far fetched to grasp, but the meaning is still profound. Regardless, the, the premise that both Shinto and Buddhism share this very basic principle helped to create a mutually beneficial means of growth within Japanese society, culture, and history. Elements of this growth are apparent throughout Tendai and are, is heavily influenced within its philosophy. If we are to practice Tendai Buddhism, we of course work on polishing our own character and spirit, but we also cannot neglect that which we usually define as not us. The principle of, of interpenetration guides us to start to look outside of the self for a broader sense of what we are. Am I not made of the same stuff, the things uh, of the things in nature? Remember, this stuff is as old as the universe. Thank you so much, Ichishima Sensei, for that one. There's, there's only a conceptual construct that defines us as separate. I am because of what all else is. I cannot be without it. It cannot be without I. We inter-are. 
There is Buddha nature underlying all phenomena. Is that not worthy of our respect, reverence, grace, harmony? Taking a note from the Shinto playbook, as it were, what if we were able um, to actually spend even a small amount of time truly venerating a kami within the natural phenomena around us? With respect comes a more, more of an acknowledgement of that non-separateness, which can lead to becoming more aware of our mutual dependence. More awareness, and the more impact of our daily actions come into focus as we more honestly appraise those actions. Therefore, how we relate to nature has a direct influence on who and how we are. As we start to have a deeper understanding of this broader sense of self, then our practice of honing and polishing our own character now becomes extended to all natural phenomena. How polished can we be if all else is sullied? Along the Buddha path, the Bodhisattva path, all sentient beings are liberated from dukkha. Let us strive to do just that as we decide to live a life that is more reverential and harmonious. Smaha. Thank you, Koshin. Thank you so much. And for the, the quote for today, not just beautiful, though the stars are like the trees in the forest, alive and breathing, and they're watching me.